Good evening, everybody. We were just having fun saying hi to people in the chat. Um, I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. We're glad you're here. Um, for those of you new to our events, WPI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs uh, that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic courses and practical campaign training and facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics and policy. Um, so tonight, uh, we wanted to explore more closely activism and advocacy uh, as it pertains to girls, women, and gender equality. And we are delighted to have with us Stephanie Foster, who has decades of experience in women's economic and political empowerment from her positions as a lawyer and advisor in the State Department, as a chief of staff in the Senate, and as, of course, as a leader in the nonprofit sector. She has just written a new book, uh, which is really a workbook uh, and helpful toolkit about activism called Take Action, Fight for women and girls. Uh, and so we are um, delighted to have her joining us this evening. I want to let everybody know uh, before we start, um, we are going to save plenty of time for your questions at the end. Um, you'll notice a button at the bottom of your screen that says ask a question. So please feel free during the discussion to uh, put a question down there. And you can also upvote um, other questions that you might be interested in as well. And if you missed any of our discussion and you want to share it with friends, uh, the replay will be available at the same link that you use to register. So Stephanie, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. We are delighted to have you here. So your book, I want to ask you, give us a sense of why you wrote the book um, and what you hope readers will take away from it. You, you focus on four main issues, education, economic opportunity, gender-based violence, and of course, political participation. So uh, what do you hope uh, readers will take away from, um, from the book? Well, first, I really want to thank you for having you know, me on to talk about the book. And uh, one other thing I've done is I have been um, a lecturer at AU in the um, uh, for women in politics. So mm -hmm. I appreciate being able to come back and talk with everybody. And I see some of my friends are on the chat. So I'm really happy to, to say hi to them, but I don't want to get distracted. Um, I really wrote the book because I saw two things happening at the same time. One is this tremendous eagerness and commitment and passion that I think a lot of younger women, although also younger men, have to really take action to try to create a more equitable, world, a more gender equal world, uh, where we are able to all, you know, participate in public life and uh, the economy in, in the way that we see fit and not be subject to discrimination, and so many other things. I just mm -hmm. think there's a real hunger out there for ad advocacy and activism. At the same time, as you said, I've done a, a tremendous amount in the advocacy space. Uh, from starting in a more traditional advocacy role uh, as a lawyer to being a Senate chief of staff to working in nonprofits and to uh, being able to work again globally, both here in the US, but with women and organizations around the world. And so I have often been asked a lot of the same questions about what people can do to really make a change or what steps they can take. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to capture that and really be able to put in one place uh, a guide to activism from my perspective, things that I've learned that have worked, things that I've seen other people do around the world that have worked, and really give people tools that they can use on a daily basis to try to make change. And I think that can be everything from big change, you know, legislative policy change, to asking questions that really go to something in your daily life, whether it's buying from a woman owned business or, you know, it's uh, there's a great story in the book about a young woman named Belen Woodard. And she uh, saw that flesh colored crayons uh, were always white, you know, sort of right. flesh color white flesh, as opposed to she was a black young woman. And so she, wanted to have a, a set of crayons available to her and to a lot of other young people that really reflected their skin tone. So she went on an advocacy campaign and uh, Crayola did change the crayons. So 
while that may seem not as momentous, um, some would say as, as big policy change, it obviously has a tremendous impact on, on the way people see themselves reflected in, in the things that they have around them every day. So I wanted to be able to help people, young women primarily is, are the audience for this book, but anybody can really use it to, to really move forward their advocacy on a daily basis. You have a great quote um, at the beginning of one, um, the f first chapter um, from Shirley Chisholm, the, um, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, mm -hmm. uh, which we, I love, of course. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, why it's important, especially for young women to feel empowered to, if they see something, say something. I know sometimes it's hard um, to do that. And what's your kind of practical advice, especially for young women? Well, I think, you know, look, I think it's challenging for all of us to find our voice over time. I think we all find it in a way that works for us. Mm -hmm. So for young women, I think, I, I think it's really important to start to feel comfortable with how you're going to take that action, whether it means you're going to practice with a friend, uh, maybe it means you're going to try to come up with some really unusual way to address an issue. I saw something today about at the College Park campus for University of Maryland. There's a lot of sexual harassment on campus. And yeah. so these young women are, you know, posting uh, or doing chalk, like chalkboard things about what's happened to them. So I think really looking for what works for you. But I mean, obviously, I would say to the bigger picture, we all need to have the most diverse groups of people focused on the issues that are in front of us today. And young women who are in college, in graduate school, in high school, just starting out in the workplace, it's really the time to shape your world and to ask those critical questions. So much of what happens that ends up creating uh, disparity in pay or disparity in treatment starts at, you know, even younger than being in high school or college or mm -hmm. your first job but it certainly does start then. And so really using that as an opportunity to ask questions about you know, equal pay or how young women are treated in terms of access to STEM uh, jobs or STEM education, really important to bring those diverse perspectives. And I think it's a good time to say that, you know, right now that I think the most sort of energizing thing is that it's such a diverse group of, of women asking questions. And so it's not just saying women are all the same and every woman needs the same thing, right? but it's, you know, looking at the intersectionality of people's lives and really trying to ensure that everyone feels like they have a way to participate in the process. And in this, I'm sure we're going to talk about women in politics and that the people who are making decisions are reflective of who we are as a, as a country so mm -hmm. and as a globe so that you see yourself uh, in the decision makers and feel like you have the ability to both become them at some point but have access to them and, and one area that certainly um uh, mobilizes and engages young people is the issue of climate um, and I know you're headed to the global climate summit so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about sort of activism and youth mobilization around that is particular issue. Yes, I'm on Friday, I'm going to the, the COP, as it's called, mm -hmm. um, for a few days, and I'm going to moderate some panels there. And it is so interesting to me, because just one of the workshops I'm doing is with a young activist, a man, who's apparently quite well known, I'm, of course, too old to know who he is. But, um, but it is this different way of thinking about activism. You know, I think obviously policy uh, policy change is important, and those decisions that happen at these global climate summits and events are critical because governments, you know, obviously can make a difference and do make a difference in terms of the regulation of the kind of things we put into our environment. But but I, and I think this is you know we see Greta Thunberg out there and mm -hmm. a lot of young activists who really just feel and they're right that things aren't happening fast enough to make change. And so I think in the climate activism space in particular, there's a lot more of um, kind of just really going almost to the barricades and, and really being willing to take actions 
that I think uh, for some of these young people, they would even say they didn't think they would ever have done um, because they, they view that their lives are going to be wholly impacted by these dramatic climate shifts. And, and they're right. Um, the other thing to say about climate, and I, I talk a little bit about this in the book, though not that much, is that women are obviously, or maybe not so obviously, impacted by climate change and disasters at larger numbers than men, mm. which, which sometimes seems counterintuitive to people. I had someone say to me the other day, well, how can that be? Because men and women live in the same places. But we know that about 80% of climate refugees are women and children. And that, uh, you know, the vast majority of uh, the people who are affected by disasters are women. And it has to do with how, you know, women's social roles, gender norms in terms of, uh, in a lot of countries, women are the people out there gathering firewood, gathering water. So when there's a massive change in climate that changes like the rivers or changes where you can get resources, it really affects their lives. And in a lot of, a lot of cases, they end up moving or leaving, um, or they're in places where there's just tremendous uh, drought or fire and they have to uh, flee for safety. So mm -hmm. these are issues that are obviously affect everyone and they are the issue of the time. And I think there's a lot of momentum, especially from young people. But I hope the thing that we also are thinking about is how to ensure that we're taking into account the impact of climate on women across the globe, sometimes in places where we just don't even know that much about what's going on. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the, you know, the practical advice that you give in the book, sort of like the step by step kind of toolkit information about how to become um, more active in policy changes or politics. Um, you have a list of steps in here, including some things like how to create a power map to mm -hmm. kind of identify areas of influence on a particular issue. So can you just spend a minute or two just talking about sort of those first steps and how to think um, about becoming involved um, specifically in a, a policy change or an issue that you care about? Of course. And, you know, I think this is something that often we do intuitively um, mm -hmm. when we want to make a change. Um, and But I do have, and I think it's like on the last page, I have the, the nine steps. But yeah. a lot of it is really, I think, the most effective advocacy is comes from people who are passionate about what they're doing mm -hmm. and that they have identified an issue that means a lot to them and has an impact on their lives. One of the most important things in advocacy is doing just that. It's really taking whatever your interest is, if it's in education or economics or political life or the, or, climate, you know, to really try to find a way to frame that issue so that it's both something you're passionate about, but specific enough that you can do something about it, you know, that you can actually make a change right. that, that you're advocating for. And I think that's really important. One of the things that the book does is give people places where they can find further information and research. And I think that gives people also the confidence to sort through like, how do they want to address issues around education? Do they want to focus on keeping girls in school, uh, in secondary school abroad? Do they want to focus on STEM education in the U.S.? Do they want to ensure that schools are safe, that there's you know viol no violence in the classrooms or violence in the, uh, the halls and the bathrooms so that it makes it harder for girls to want to stay in school? So really re doing the research figuring out what you're interested in, trying to understand what works, whether it's here in the US or abroad. And I think we have a lot to learn from mm -hmm. what's going on in other places, things that have worked there, and then things you know, that have worked here, but really trying to meld those together. And then lastly, I would say two other things. One of the most powerful things you can do as an advocate is ask questions. like. You know, why are there no um, or fewer young women in this uh, in this particular STEM class? Why are the toys segregated by by aisle? 
you mm-hmm. know, why are men and women paid differently for the same job? Um, all those questions can really drive you to being an effective advocate. But lastly, very important, and I talk a little bit about this in the book also, is the idea of finding other people who are also interested in making change. Mm. We can't make change alone. You know, advocacy is about bringing people together who share a common goal and being strategic about how to meet that goal. So very important to think about whether it's in your neighborhood or in your community or globally, who else is working on this issue that you can join forces with and really try to move things forward. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people think about starting their own organization. And I think that's, that can work, but oftentimes I think it's more, has more of an impact to really find an organization that's close to what you want to do and try to change maybe how they do what they're doing or to bring in a new set of, of, um, advocates. Maybe you're going to bring in people from a particular, you know, ethnic group, or you're going to bring in a a youth, uh, you know, uh, a group of young people, or you're going to bring in faith leaders, whatever it is, it's sometimes I think easier to find a group that's already working on your issue and sort out, is there a place for me in this group? And how can I expand what that group is doing? Right. Uh, Power in numbers and also not reinventing the wheel too. Right. Anyways. Um, the second chapter of the book focuses on the issue of um, education and the power of education uh, for girls and young women and making sure um, girls have access to education. Um, you know, is that crucial, obviously, first step toward gender equality? Um, what have, did you find, you write a little bit about this in the book, about what works to keep girls um, in school, especially as we think um, globally, um, you know, problems that certainly have been exacerbated by COVID in, you know, countries around the world, including a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what do we know that works to keep girls in school? Well, and, and this is obviously also a huge issue that, you know, we're seeing what's going on in Afghanistan with, right. you know, schools being closed and um, girls not being able to go to school. So a lot of the things that work are, are really very um common sense, but I'll just outline a few of them. Mm-hmm. You know, research has shown that when parents, you know, who often if they have daughters and sons in a, in a place where education is costly, whether it's because of tuition or uniforms or fees, they often prefer to send their sons to school for a lot of reasons around gender norms. Right. One way to get around that is studies have shown once parents understand that sending their girls to school and getting keeping their daughters in secondary school leads to uh, jobs that pay well, um, jobs that are you know adding to the family's income. That tends to keep uh, have parents be much more interested in keeping their their daughters in school. Right. Uh, reduced cost for tuition, uniforms, fees all those things, meals at schools, which we know in the U.S. keeps a lot of kids, you know, able to actually learn when they're in school. So really getting at that financial issue that often is a huge barrier to keeping girls in school. And also, you know, we know there's fairly, I mean, around the world, there's been dramatic increases in keeping girls in primary school. COVID has had a negative impact on that. But secondary school is really where, you know, there needs to be such a focus because that's where you learn the skills you need for jobs and critical thinking and and analytical skills. I think another argument that works on the policy level is the argument that if you keep girls in school, you know, that your economy grows. Mm -hmm. And there's this one stunning statistic I, I always think about, which is if, if in India, 1% of more girls stayed in school, their GDP would rise $5 billion. Now, India is a huge country with a lot of people. So it makes sense in that context, but you realize how important uh, it is in terms of 
you know, not only for the young woman and her family and her community to have good paying jobs, to have the ability to really contribute to her family's income, uh, to be able to have more control over her life, but it also really helps the, the larger economy of her community, of her region, of her country. Mm -hmm. And I think those are really important arguments to make, along with the kind of incentives that also can keep uh, girls in school. The one last one I would say, because I think this is always so interesting to me as an American, is that one of the biggest studies in the world that um, was done was done by the World Bank in Brazil, where they did something called a conditional cash transfer, which is just a payment to a family, but dependent on... Uh, in that case, the family sending their kids to school, getting immunizations, um, you know, sending, doing preventive health care screenings, all those things that are really important. And when that, those investments were made over a long period of time, um, girls and young women in, in Brazil, in those communities, saw an, you know, a, an increase in staying in school. And their families were more motivated to keep them in school in part because there was a cash payment, right. but also it kind of created this, this uh, norm about staying in school. So I think things like con conditional cash transfers, they can also be in some places, you know, families get livestock or some other, you know, resource that's important in that community, mm -hmm. really to help make the, make the economic case uh, to families that this is important. You you mentioned Afghan Afghanistan, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because um, I know it's it's an issue that is important to you. Um, can you talk about current efforts underway to help um, women and girls who are still there in the country under now Taliban rule? Yes, um, I obviously for served at the embassy in Afghanistan, or maybe not so obviously, but I did and have worked on Afghanistan when I was at the State Department. So th there have been massive efforts to get people out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, as we know, for all the people we've gotten out, 40 million Afghans remain in their country and are, they are not really planning to leave. So that's about 20 million women and obviously children. Right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, erratic, sort of policy by the Taliban. The Taliban sought at the very beginning, uh, two or three days after they took over the country to say they wanted women and girls to be part of Afghan society and sort of to, I think, try to make Afghan women feel better and probably the international community. But we've really seen just, you know, a lot of erratic things that have been, women have borne the brunt again, being asked to stay home from work and while girls can go to school um, to sixth grade, for the most part, uh, in a, with a few exceptions, not secondary school. Mm -hmm. So what's going on is really an effort by a lot of governments to try to get aid to Afghanistan right now. It's a horrible humanitarian crisis because the economy is on the verge of collapse. Winter is coming and winter in that part of the world is very harsh. So there's a, there are a lot of humanitarian issues. What's going on is the U.S. and other donors have started to get humanitarian aid to Afghanistan, but not through the Afghan government, mm -hmm. uh, really sending that aid through uh, non-governmental organizations so that there's a sense that those non-governmental organizations are much more in tune with what's going on on the ground. So Afghan women who I interviewed along with one of my colleagues over the last few weeks, really want to ensure that as we we collectively, the international community, put that aid forward and try to support Afghanistan, that we're not losing sight of women's rights and human rights, and that that aid is to some degree conditioned on the Taliban government taking actions to, to uh, support women's rights, to keep girls in school. So there's a lot of uh, advocacy around those issues to try to ensure that any kind of uh, aid, again, is conditioned on on those kind of policy changes uh, for the Taliban or any kind of recognition of the government. So that that's what's going on in, on the policy level. What we're hearing is that women are still, 
you know, running some businesses, mainly businesses that only serve other women. Mm -hmm. um, and that the Taliban is again, in some places, okay with that in some places, not also, we're hearing that in some places, you know, women doctors are going back to work in some places, not the bottom line is it's very uneven and erratic and there women have in the past, of course, borne the brunt of the Taliban and most people, myself included, feel that's what is happening again now. Mm -hmm. I mean, child marriage is going up. There's all sorts of, of indicators that are not good for Afghan women. And what, what do you see as, I mean, are there any, what else can we do here, I guess, to um, when we're talking about activism, um, what can we do um, just at a smaller level to, you know, help Afghan women over there? So what we heard a couple of things for the women who are here and the families, yeah. I mean, sort of two things. So for that group of people who are here, you know, whether it's volunteering to help teach English mm -hmm. or, in, you know, get in touch with the groups that are on the ground here with Afghan refugees, trying to figure out what they need. Do they need clothing and they're settling in? Do they need, you know, sewing machines if they're the kind of, if they're tailors and, and all sorts of things like that. So really there's a whole stream of people who are trying to get Afghan refugees who are here settled in terms of food and clothing and jobs and really trying to ensure that they're able to really acclimate to being in a very different place. With regard to the people who remain, we were really interested in these interviews because we asked them, uh, these people we interviewed, what they thought people, not just the government, could do. And mm -hmm. they said that us talking about the importance of women's rights and human rights in Afghanistan is really important to them. And they think that that makes a difference because mm -hmm. for many women there and men there, they can't, they feel they can't speak out for themselves right now. Right. That it's a very dangerous time. People are nervous about, you know, is someone going to turn them in or inform on them? Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, are, are they going to be, hurt or killed. Mm -hmm. So it's a really hard time for those people to speak up for themselves. And so for us, talking about Afghan women, talking about what they've been able to accomplish in the past, but also talking about as we move forward and try to figure out how to, uh, how to address the, the real needs of people that we don't lose sight of what women need, mm -hmm. that we don't just say, yes, we need to send aid Mm -hmm. We should be talking about making sure that there are women involved in aid distribution, that there are women involved in designing aid distribution, because we know from other places that if you have a hundred pound sacks of rice and you're giving them out, women, for the most part, can't carry those hundred pound sacks of rice. So mm -hmm. men carry them and then right. men control the food. So maybe we need rice in smaller sacks that women can carry, uh, you know, so really trying to make the point that women need to be engaged as they these plans to uh, to try to address humanitarian issues are developed and i think that's a, actually a theme throughout the book and throughout advocacy is that women's engagement whether it's in politics or uh, at the grassroots you know food distribution level or right. in the economy is just so important and thinking, like you said, ab about that through a lens of, of how it can help women. And many Absolutely. Women, right. You know? um, speaking of, of, of helping women, um, we're thinking about, you know, the economy. And um, you spend um, a chapter in the book on women's economic opportunity and talk a lot about, you know, where we are, especially in the United States, um, about, you know, women in the C-suite, um, some, some advances that have been made, but a long way to go. Um, and then you also talk about um, women in the economy in light of COVID and how that has sort of magnified the inequalities that we see for women, both at home and at work. Um, so talk a little bit more about, about that. Sure. COVID has obviously upended so much of our lives. Mm -hmm. 
one of the most important statistics, I think, is that globally, women are 39% of the formal labor force. We know women are in the informal labor force in high numbers, but 39% of the formal labor force are comprised of women, but 54% of job losses have, uh, women have, you know, had 54% of the formal economy job losses across the globe. So, you know, and we know that's for a, for a lot of reasons that are obvious. Care responsibilities um, have kept women home. You know, educating their kids have kept women at home. Some of the jobs that women have done have been in the sectors that have been the hardest hit, especially mm -hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic. So there's been a tremendous amount of impact on women in a negative way about COVID. One of the most interesting things I think is the idea that we, and I, I agree with this, that you know we all are now talking about flexible work schedules and being able to do things like be on uh, you know, the, a Zoom call as opposed to having to go into an office. But what right. that doesn't really talk about is the fact that for many women, that isn't even an option if you're a healthcare worker, if you work right. at a grocery store. So really trying to look at this issue in a very intersectional way understanding the impact on women, but also understanding that some of the solutions only probably reach one segment of the population and not, you know, not everybody. Obviously, one of the issues here that's so important is the care economy and really trying to ensure that people have more access to childcare and family leave so that they can buffer uh, and, and balance their lives. But overall, you know, the increasing number of women women's participation in the economy is so critical for students who may be on uh, the call or on this uh, call, thinking mm -hmm. about how you really look at your sort of work and career in a very uh, strategic way. Obviously, I think people should really do what they are the most passionate about. But having said that, really thinking about how to ensure that uh, you're working somewhere where people are treated fairly, where there's no discrimination, no gender pay gap, and being in a place where you feel comfortable enough to ask those questions mm -hmm. of your employer. I do think people are asking those questions a lot more today, right? because we know that people are leaving the workforce when they don't feel comfortable, uh, or it, and actually in COVID, when they feel like they're not fulfilled uh, at the workplace. So these are really important issues across the globe. Again, another theme I think of the book is it can be from the simplest thing, right? Asking a question at your workplace about uh, what the discrimination, anti-discrimination policies are or uh, what has happened in terms of who's been, um, if somebody has been, there've been allegations of sexual harassment, are there statistics about um, how those allegations are resolved or are they, are there gender statistics? Are they race, divided by race? Those kind of questions to also thinking about how to change the laws in your country. Because we know from what, there's a big World Bank study that comes out called Women, Business and the Law. It comes out every two years and surveys the laws of every country around issues that have an impact on women's ability to work. And of the 190 countries that are surveyed, I'm just getting it right here, 88 of them prevent women from being in certain job categories. Hmm. Some countries uh, have an earlier retirement age for women, which on its face might seem great, but that means you don't work for, say, five or 10 more years, which means your pension or your retirement is less. Right. Some countries, thankfully, a small number of them, um, it's only 15, uh, men have to um, approve their wives working. So, you know, there's, there are, there's a lot of opportunity for policy advocacy uh, out there. I will say two years ago, there were six countries where the laws were 100% equal. Two years, so now two years later, it's 10. Some progress, not a lot, mm -hmm. but I think reports like that give a good sense of the framework for issues mm -hmm. that women and girls face. And then in the day-to-day -day kind of reality uh, of the moment, there are many things that people can do at the workplace, women can do to try to ensure that their particular workplace is fair. 
Um, before we go to some questions, I want to jump to my favorite chapter, of course, on um, women in politics, a chapter you have entitled See Jane Run. And you start with a, a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher. If you want a speech to be made, ask a man. If you want anything done, ask a woman. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the positive impact that women um, have on public policy. Yes. I mean, I, I think this is one of the issues that I also have worked a lot on and feel really strongly about the the studies are, you know, fairly clear. I, I'm going to kind of loop it back to climate change because mm -hmm. I think this is a good example of a, something that's in the moment. Studies have shown that countries that have more women in parliaments tend to approve climate and environmental treaties at much higher rates. Hmm. So women tend to have a focus on issues that might be a little bit different than men. They bring different perspectives. Women also work on, on all issues, of course, but we do see that policies around education, funding for education tend to increase. We see that in studies as well. So we know that, that women have an impact on policy. We also know from research that women tend to uh, be more collaborative. There is a study or a, a, a study that I hope would still be true. So I'm just going to use it because it's a little old, but it's only from the 115th Congress, which was really not that long ago, um, where uh, Elise Stefanik and Alyssa Slotkin, you know, co-sponsored 85 bills. Mm -hmm. So it is a little more partisan of an environment than it even was several years ago. But I, the studies have shown over time that women do tend to be more collaborative right. across whatever aisles they have across various uh, political parties. But of course, you know, not all the time. And we don't expect that women have different political behavior in some ways than men. But I think we do see more collaboration. There are also studies, of course, that show that women um, are much more responsive to constituents. And I have to say, having worked for a woman politician, Senator Mikulski, she was the master of really being able to take people's everyday uh, concerns and experiences and really be responsive to them and talk about them in a way that I think really made a difference in, in their lives, then take that into the legislative process. One of the pieces of legislation she was the most proud of over all those years she was in Congress, and she was the longest serving woman when she retired, was a, uh, a piece of legislation she co-sponsored with Kay Bailey Hutchison, um, a senator, a Republican senator from Texas, um, on homemaker IRAs. So the obviously the issue is that if you're a homemaker, you're not in a formal job where you can contribute to an IRA. And so the law was changed to allow homemakers to open and, and contribute money to IRAs. And it was a great example of something that was a very real issue that actually a constituent had brought to Senator Mikulski. Um, and she, you know, knew that this was an issue she wanted to work on. She wanted to work on it on a bipartisan basis. She felt very comfortable that Senator Hutchison would be interested and she was, and they were really able to make a difference. So that's one example. The second example I'll give, which is again, something that is we, I think, now take for granted, but uh, Senator Mikulski, Senator Snow, Olympia Snow from Maine, mm -hmm. um, Connie Morella, who is um, a professor here at mm -hmm. AU, um, and uh, they all decided that they did not know when they found out that at the National Institute of Health, this was many years ago, that uh, all the tests that were being done for new drugs were being done on men regardless of whether it was, uh, you know, whatever it was, they were all being done on men. And so they really demanded that NIH change the way they do drug testing so that mm. if they're tested on uh, any kind of drug or device on men and women of different ethnic groups and races, uh, because obviously people have different physiologies. And in fact, because of that, we now know and can really be very much more clear about what kind of interventions uh, medical interventions work better with men, um, which ones work, you know, better with women, which ones are, you know, more effective depending on your race or your age. And so that was something that made a huge difference for so many people across the country uh, at a time where 
as we look back, it's shocking to me that that was even an issue, but it was. Right. So we see that, you know, often women are able to really come with a, a very specific thing they hear from a constituent and, and then take that on and really make change. Let me get to a couple of questions here. Um, this one is from um, Lucy Getman's uh, Women in Politics class. Um, Hi, Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> one of our students is asking, um, how much of a role will wide cultural changes like eliminating stereotypes and redefining gender roles have in the fight for equality? Uh, and how can individuals help move us toward that? Well, I mean, I think, look, I think one of the most interesting things that's happening right now is really the whole, this whole opening up of a conversation about the fact that people have, that, that people lead, not everyone leads the same life. I'm trying to say it in the most kind of simple way, right? There, people lead very different lives based on who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Their, their age, their, their sex, their gender, which is different, their race, you know, their income level, um, who they are, where they live. And so I think really opening up that conversation so that as we're developing policy, I mean, I think it's critical, obviously, that we ensure that women and girls are part of the equation. But a lot of this is about gender equality so that we're sure and equity that everybody has an equal opportunity so that we're not saying that only we only want women to have you know access to all the their the opportunities to do what they want but we want men to too men and boys and others right but this is about opening up that conversation and really trying i think to get the conversation to a place where people can have can really learn about each other's lives and mm -hmm. try to use that information to move policy forward um Here's a question from Isabel. Um, she says, do you see any connections uh, between women's representation and national governments and progress toward gender equity for um, all women in certain countries? Sure. I mean, yes, I think the statistics will show you that in a lot of countries that have very high numbers of women, whether it's in parliament or executive branch offices, um, there are laws that are much more equitable. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question though then becomes really looking, taking the next step and saying, are those laws enforced? Um, are, how are they implemented? So yes, I mean, I think having women in office does several things. First of all, it is a representational issue, right? People then see others who are like them in the policymaking process. Again, right. whether it's a member of parliament or a judge or a president of a country or a defense minister. But then the next question is how do you take that and, and move it into a policy that's that can be seen as much more about gender equality? I always say that not every woman is a feminist and not every feminist is a woman. So it, it really gets you to looking at the difference between representation, pure representation, mm -hmm. and policy change. They're interlinked, but not always the same. Also, I think very important to look at how laws are, are implemented, because it's, well, it's not easy to pass a law. It's sometimes easier to pass a law than actually implement it in the most effective mm -hmm. way. That's a good point. Um, this is a question from um, Sydney. Uh, she says, and you you do have um, a part of the chapter on women in politics. You talk about um, women expressing their opinions on media platforms. And Sydney is asking, what role do you see social media playing in advocacy, particularly among young people? Does it help or hurt? I think it does both. I mean, obviously, social media is in our lives mm -hmm. and it can be used to really amplify women's voices. Social media is a reflection of our society broadly. So what we see on social media is a reflection of us, whether we like that or not, I think. <laughs> um, so I think, yes, it can help amplify women's voices. It can get the, the, the word out. It can really be a good tool for advocacy the same time, it can be tremendously detrimental 
for a number of reasons. I mean, one, we've seen the research that has just come out about Instagram and, and how social media in general gives, especially young women, a lot of their negative feelings about their own lives and their bodies, which I think is a bad thing. Also, in the political realm, one of the most disturbing things is the use of social media to deter women from getting involved in politics. So whether it's online violence, which can be can lead to real violence if people right. post where somebody lives or something like that, but just this idea that you can um, create this bubble online where you're making women who are, who may want to run for office think about it, really step back because there's so much harshness. And I think Julia Gillard, who had, was the prime minister of, of Australia, talked about that, that she, you know, was just subject to so much online harassment and social media uh, negativity that she really felt like she could not stay in office any longer. Mm -hmm. So this happens at every level. Um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes does lead to actual in real life violence. Mm -hmm. So I, social media is a very, I think it's a very complicated question yeah. that we're all grappling with. Yeah. The good and the bad. Um, here's another question from Isabel. She says, um, it sounds like earlier investments um, go a long way to improve the trajectory of girls' lives. Um, are there any examples of activism that can support older women as they age and might not be able to support themselves uh, through work? That raises a lot of really good issues, mm -hmm. one of which is that activism at, around uh, pay at a young age is important because pay gaps only get bigger over time. Right. And, and then obviously it has an impact on your pension and retirement and ability to support yourself. So there are some limited, I think, uh, groups that really work on trying to get to address issues around age discrimination, which I think is very real and more real for women. I think obviously in the COVID pandemic, this has been a big issue. So yes, I, there are those efforts. There are some groups that work on these issues all the time. One actually of the most effective advocates or advocacy groups around any issue that has to do with anyone over 50 is AARP. Right. And as much as we sort of joke about getting an AARP <laughs> card, they actually are extremely effective advocates. Yeah. And, and for example, have worked really hard on the issue of prescription drug um, negotiations, the ability to negotiate prescription drug prices down, which is the number one issue that their members have raised mm -hmm. as something that they feel has a negative impact on their lives as drug prices often spiral out of control with not a lot of logic to them. So yes, groups like that are certainly working at a meta level. And there are some groups at local levels. But again, I think that is an issue that's probably less, less in the advocacy space than it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question here about working with Emily's list. It says, do you all work with Emily's list? And WPI is nonpartisan and does, you know, engages both sides of the aisle in terms of um, electing women. But I guess that question just um, if I can just peg off of that a little bit and get your opinion on um, organizations that whose purpose it is to uh, elect women and sort of um, the benefit of those, especially in terms of um, funding uh, campaigns, et cetera. I think those organizations are really important. So I think though a couple things are happen at the same time. Yes, there, you know, there's Emily's list. There are groups that fund mainly Republican women. Mm -hmm. There are nonpartisan groups. Running Start mm -hmm. is a, a good example of of groups that are, you know, able to really train women and try to get at the internal capacity issues, mm -hmm. ensuring that women have the skills to develop a voter outreach plan, to raise money, to do everything you have to do to get from starting where you are to hopefully getting elected to office. At the same time, 
it's important that groups and and I think actually in this case, I think WPI and other, you know, kind of thought leaders in the space really talking about the importance of women in political office mm -hmm. and bringing that that uh, sort of that to the table and really trying to change our gender norms about what an elected official looks like. Mm -hmm. I would add on that, I think what we saw in the election um, yesterday, at least one, one story um, is that these pipeline issues are important. So really investing in women early is important for their careers and for also changing the face of who is in politics. So yesterday, Michelle Wu was the was elected mayor of Boston. Right. She's not the first woman, uh, but she's the first woman elected and the first woman of color and the first elected and the first Asian um, mayor of Boston, a city that has traditionally not actually been all that friendly <laughs> to non-white <laughs> politicians, yeah. uh, period. Yeah. But I read something this morning about, you know, the pipeline issues in terms of that city council, you know, 10 or 15 years ago was basically there were no women. And mm -hmm. then little by little, more and more women got on the council. Ayanna Presley, who's now a member of Congress, uh, was sort of the breakout person. But looking now at that council, it's much more diverse. And we see that um, Michelle Wu won. Uh, and it's really a very historic win for that city. Also, you know, in Virginia, the new lieutenant governor is a, a, a black woman, Winsome Sears. Um, you know, I think we're seeing sort of different, you know, different people coming into office who don't look like the traditional norm. So the groups that work with all of those candidates and the political parties, right, the RNC, the DNC, all right. the party committees, they're, I mean, I think they're all worth investing in to really ensure that the, that women who want to run can be the most equipped to run mm -hmm. and be the most competitive and be the most able to attract money, which is unfortunately important in our system. Right, right. Um, this is a good question to end on um, from Isabel also. She um, was asking about what who your role models are in sort of the gender equality activism space. But Isabel has a lot of questions. I know. <laughs> She's our, question, uh, our questioner tonight. Well, really one of my biggest role models has been Senator Mikulski, who I worked yeah. for, because she really broke the mold. If you think about who she is and mm -hmm. when she came to office, she was elected to the Senate. The only other woman was Senator Kassebaum from Kansas, a Republican woman. Um, they were very different, but they worked together very well. But she really showed that you don't have to look like or act like, you know, the guys to be right. effective. And she always said, I'm, you know, I don't want to be the only, I want to be the first. And I want, you know, I want to have men who are part of the equation and help uh, us make change. And so she was always really, really clear about that men were the enemy. They were part of her solution to really address issues for her constituents. So Senator Mikulski, definitely, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, all the women who've run, I think, for major political party office and who've been firsts, mm -hmm. whether it's Shirley Chisholm or Hillary Clinton, I think these are women who really have made a difference mm -hmm. over time. Margaret Thatcher, a woman I really don't think I ever would have agreed with on anything, but I give her a lot of credit for being out there and really changing the face of who could be a prime minister. And again, a place not <laughs> super friendly to women. Right, right. So a lot of, of those those women really are the women I've, I have uh, looked up to over time and women in the economy, you know, economic space. There are just so many. I will tell you, and I'll end with one story, my mother was a local elected official. So I always hate it when people say they, their mother is their role model, but <laughs> um, she was in that case because mm -hmm. she was very much a grassroots political activist. She ran for school board. She mm -hmm. literally spent no money, 
and she won because she went and she literally spoke to every single person in the community in which she lived, which was a small town, but probably three times before the election. So I learned from her and from Senator Mikulski, yeah, the power of really just talking to people and yeah. listening to people. Well, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with us in your in your book and tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it, Stephanie. And I want to let um, everyone know of a couple of other Women on Wednesdays we have coming up that I hope you all will join us for um, next Wednesday um, at uh, same time, same station, 6 p.m. Um, we are going to have um, Senator Maisie Hirono um, of Hawaii to discuss her new book. Uh, it's called Heart of Fire, an Immigrant Daughter Story. Mm -hmm. um, then on the 17th, we're going to talk about the ERA with um, Dr. Rebecca DeWolf, who's actually teaching a course for us um, this semester on the topic um, um, her, she's just published a new book called Gendered Citizenship, the Original Conflict over the Equal Rights Amendment, 1920 mm -hmm. to 1963. So she'll be here on the 17th. Um, and then on December 8th, we're going to have Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California and uh, documentary filmmaker Abby Ginsburg to discuss uh, the new documentary called Barbara Lee Speaking Truth to Power. Uh, and we also have, um, for those who register for that, um, we will be able to send you a link uh, so you can watch the documentary uh, ahead of our discussion. So we hope folks will join us for that. And again, Stephanie, um, thanks so much for being here. And we hope, um, hope to see everybody soon. Have a good night. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.